Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, How Implementing Data Governance with Knowledge Graphs Enables Enterprise Artificial Intelligence. Let me start by introducing you to today's speakers. We have Irene Polakoff, CEO and co-founder, and Robert Coyne, CMO and co-founder at Top Quadrant. Robert will get us started here in just a second. However, let's review a few logistical items. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along by using your GoToWebinar controls. To post questions, please look on the right-hand side control panel and you should see a drop-down box for questions. If you click on the box, you should be able to post your question at any time during the presentation. We will address as many of those questions as time allows at the conclusion of the webinar. We will also be recording today's webinar and we'll send a link to the recorded version as well as to the slide deck. With that, I will hand it over to Robert to get us started. Robert. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. For those who may not know us, Top Quadrant was founded in 2001, uh, the same year that the vision of the semantic web was born. Ever since then, we've been engaged in applying that technology to create enterprise applications and to make enterprise information meaningful. The technology has been variously known, as many of you I think know, as semantic technology, semantic web, linked data, but more recently, it's become more widely known as knowledge graph technology. And since 2015, our focus has been entirely on providing comprehensive data governance solutions based on knowledge graphs. Today's presenter, Irene Polakoff, is the CEO of Top Quadrant, and Irene has a long career and deep expertise in not only applying knowledge graphs to enterprise data management, but in helping to create and shape the standards for knowledge graphs through the World Wide Web Consortium. Today, she'll first provide a very brief history of knowledge graphs, and then outline how they address uh, challenges of data governance, and then give another brief overview of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Then she'll discuss how knowledge graphs not only provide a powerful platform for integrated data governance, but also for strategic enterprise AI and machine learning. And finally, she'll, and most importantly, I think show examples of real world uh, applications of how knowledge graphs support rules and learning uh, that can add new knowledge that can support further learning in a virtuous cycle. So with that, I will turn it over to Irene for the presentation. Thank you, Robert, for the introduction. And um, you should now see my screen. Uh, I will start, as uh, Robert said, with a brief history of uh, knowledge graphs. What are they, where they come from, um, and, and so on. And I'll start my historical retrospective with 2001. The gentleman you see on the left here is um, Tim Berners-Lee, as um, who is widely recognized as a creator of the World Wide Web. And he was also an inspiration and a thought leader behind so-called you know, semantic web. Uh, from the beginning, his original idea for the web was that it's not going to be just a web of documents, but it will be a web of knowledge, connecting all sorts of information, structured and unstructured, in a meaningful way. And the meaning for the information is provided by the metadata that describes it. So using web as a place to host information, um, data, and metadata alike. That vision, of course, needed standards because you know, in order to represent something on the web, uh, web is, is strongly based and built upon a foundation of standards. And you need those standards to um, represent this knowledge and uh, uh, distributed across the internet and, of course, then also aggregated from those different sources. So the reason uh, why 2001, uh, why you see here 2001 is because 2001 was the year uh, when very first 
semantic web slash knowledge graph standards was published, a standard called RDF, or Resource Description Framework. In the years that followed, additional standards became available. Um, the standard stock was building up and technology was maturing. Um, I had the privilege to work with um, team with, with his help on a standard called Chaco, which is um, a way to represent a deeper meaning and, and rules in the semantic web. So that's 2001. Now, a decade, near a little bit over a decade has passed. And the term knowledge graph uh, first appeared on the scene. This term was actually coined by Google and uh, soon became very popular, just like anything Google tends to do. Prior to 2012, Google was primarily focused on using various algorithmic and statistical approaches to deliver the best results depending on users' you know, search queries and, and criteria. And around 2012, or maybe a year or two before, Google realized that that alone, the algorithmic and statistical approach to solving this problem was not sufficient. And they started to build something that they called Knowledge Graph, um, which is uh, a large knowledge base of sort of common sense knowledge of facts. Um, and you, you'll see the result of it, not only in terms of how Google delivers uh, search results to you, but you also visually see it when you run uh, some search queries, you may see some structured data on the site that makes it possible for you to navigate and see additional information. As we see here, um, this lady, uh, Ada Lovelace, she was a mathematician many, many years ago who was born in London, so she was British, and she worked on the very first computer. And we see a number of facts about her that, of course, she is a parent, uh, she's a person, so things like her date of birth, and when she died, and when she was born, what she's known for, you know, her family situation, et cetera, are applicable to, to people and important. And then there's a link to London, which is you know where she was born, and London, London is a city, and has its own metadata and characteristics that have to do with its location and the fact that it's part of the UK, et cetera. So all of this is sort of like common sense knowledge that is now captured in this uh, knowledge graph. And then interestingly, you see some statistical information, what people who search for Ada Lovelace also commonly search for. And when you look at it, you could kind of understand uh, why. We see uh, Alan Turing, so he's connected to computers. He's also a computer scientist. We see uh, Grace Hopper, who is uh, a female and, and a very well-known computer scientist. So we're going to start, in this example, we see already a combination of kind of statistical results the, and this um, knowledge that would help us understand why people are interested in, in, in these topics and maybe predict what else they may be interested in based on combining those statistical results with uh, more structured knowledge representation. That is an important fact, and we will return to it multiple times um, throughout this webinar. So that was in 2012. And then um, we go forward one more decade and come to <clears throat> nearly now, well, 2020, but um, also in 2019, there was basically an explosion of interest in knowledge graphs. Lots of information about knowledge graphs in the news, um, many different um, Graph, the new graph databases appearing, lots of questions about what are knowledge graphs, how they may be different from just a graph database, what are they good for, and, and, and so on. So conferences, articles, um, new technologies, research, new implementations, lots of things uh, 
now happening in, in, this, in this space. So what are the knowledge graphs? Um, knowledge graphs represent information in, in a form of connected nodes and links. So it's a graph part of the knowledge graph. Um, and it's uh, arguably the closest to um, how people um, store information in their, in their head and uh, how they connect information in, in their mind. The important part and the knowledge part of the graph is that um, this is not just about the underlying facts. This is also about the meaning of those, those facts. So there can be different types and different instances of knowledge graph depending on, on what knowledge is uh, captured by them and depending to, um, uh, depending to the, whether it's facts, whether it's uh, reach uh, metadata, semantics, rules, and, and, and so on. So let's take a look at this a little bit more concretely by, by example. So when we're talking about facts, we saw some facts about uh, Ada and uh, where she was born and so on. And here's another example also about the Persians. So we're interested in, in the knowledge about people. We are in this knowledge domain of Persians. And um, we could talk about someone called James, and this is actually James Bond. And the fact that he has blue eyes and who his father is, and he is he's a person. So this is kind of underlying uh, fact or, or data. Then there is a model or metadata of this information. A person could actually have an eye color, um, a place, a city such as London will not have an eye color. People have parents and they have two parents. So now we know that if we have a data about a person, we may be able to ask certain questions like, what is the person's eye color? That's a valid question to ask and a valid criteria to apply to, to, a, to a person. And uh, we also see uh, a little bit uh, reach type of the uh, metadata as well. So a person has parents and two parents, in fact, and uh, a person's father is also a parent and uh, he, is, he is male. So that becomes to be uh, a bit more uh, like a rule. And even higher level of the rule, that tells us something like if both person's parents have blue eyes, this person uh, we also have blue eyes. So that helps us in a number of ways. First of all, we could infer additional facts based of, from the available information. If we, we do know the uh, eye color of the parents, so this rule could help us infer a reason about the eye, eye color of the child. could also help us detect any issues if that color is not what it's supposed to be. Maybe there is something wrong with our knowledge. Maybe there is something wrong um, with the data. So different, uh, different types of graphs can contain uh, different types of knowledge in terms of, um, in terms of different dom domains and also in terms of different level of characteristics of, of that knowledge. Um, as Robert mentioned, Top Quadrant provides um, tools for data governance. This is our area of focus. And um, with that, I want to talk about why knowledge graphs for data governance. One of the characteristics of the problems and challenges of data governance is that there is lots of information. And the information is very diverse. Um, different types of perspectives, uh, different types of formats and representations. All of this needs to come together in order for us to make sense of that information um, in the context of, of its use. So we believe that the solution to this issue is to create a knowledge graph 
that would represent all the different sources of information and represent them in a highly contextual way, connecting connected to other type of information, information about systems that process that data, information uh, about policies that applicable to this data, infrastructure that host those systems, business activities that using those systems and, uh, and so on. And once you connect it in this rich way, then um, you can use this information to guide variety of, of business decisions. So we believe that knowledge graphs overcome uh, key challenges in, in data governance uh, by helping uh, users search across all, uh, all knowledge that's relevant for data governance, connecting technical metadata about data elements, and we'll see example of it um, later on, to the business meaning of this data element, and broader to where they're being used in order to provide us with end-to-end -end data lineage, which is important for a variety of uh, reasons, such as regulatory compliance. Now, knowledge graphs can uh, represent any type of information. So this means that you could also represent regulations and various aspects of regulations as knowledge graphs. So it's not just, um, it's not just describing data sources, but it's uh, broader and much more uh, capable. Using rules in the knowledge graph, you could enrich the available data. You could also uh, leverage information that is available on this broader uh, semantic web, you know, the knowledge graphs that are internal and external and can possibly be connected and again, that, re that leads to more enriched uh, knowledge resources. Standards let us connect things uh, more readily across the silos. They also let us use standard APIs. And um, another interesting part of the application is also that connecting all these data assets may, may be able to lead us to understanding the value of our data is actually uh, a very important uh, question. And uh, if we're managing data, then its value, of course, um, is important from a number of perspectives, both where do we focus and also how we justify uh, our efforts. So um, we end up quarant believe uh, very strongly that the knowledge graphs are a key and a critical foundation for uh, data governance and management of information assets. We believe in it so strongly that we've actually built a product um, on this foundation, the product called Subred Edge, Enterprise Data Governance, and um, it's being used by many different organizations to support a variety of data governance uh, needs. I remember I mentioned that um, there can be different types of knowledge graphs depending on the type of information that they store. Um, and in case of Tabred Edge, we actually categorize those different types of graphs. You see them on the left and um, as information about enterprise assets, things like forms, reports, business processes, people, resources. Technical assets, this tend to be uh, technology assets, applications, infrastructure servers, and so on. Uh, data assets, which are data sources, uh, glossaries, and a number of other knowledge graphs that are managed, knowledge graph types that are managed by Tabred Edge. Behind all of this are the models and, and the rules describing this information. Uh, much of it is already predefined in, um, in Tabred Edge. That's what we're calling uh, asset types. But it all uses very open infrastructure so our customers can, um, can extend it. 
and add their own, take advantage of what's pre-built, but also extend it and add um, their, their own information. So having talked about the knowledge graphs, let me uh, talk a bit about AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, machine learning, because today um, people typically talk about AI and machine learning together. There is um, quite a bit of a focus uh, on machine learning within AI and see how that uh, comes to light and how that connects to, to knowledge graph. So there's many definitions of AI. In general, it's an umbrella term. Um, and the definition that I like um, particularly is uh, comes from Jeffrey Dismit. He's the principal software engineer at Red Hat, working on the various uh, planning uh, algorithms. And he says that um, AI solutions are for problems with a non-deterministic answer and or inevitable margins of error. So what does it mean? Well, it's, it's, a, it's actually a very broad set of problems. There are some problems that have um, a very clear answer that is always the same. Two plus two is always four. There is no ifs or buts about it. And uh, we can be quite certain about it. But there are many other questions um, that are not as easy to answer. And um, there is some definitely margin of doubt and margin of, of error. For example, will your loan application be approved? Well, we could predict some likelihood of it, but we can't know 100%. And lots of information comes into it. How well you prepare you prepare it, you know, um, how, um, when, who you apply for a loan to, when you apply for a loan to, maybe even the set of mind of the person who is processing your application. So um, uncertainty, some um, not so deterministic um, outcome and some margin of error. So just like it's a wide set of problems to which AI techniques could uh, apply to. This also means that uh, AI techniques include a very wide array of tools, ranging from machine learning to various uh, rule-based systems and expert systems to various probability optimization and, and search algorithms. And it could also be said that the definition of AI actually evolves with time. And typically, uh, when we people talk about AI, we include on the AI the most groundbreaking development. And yesterday's successes, no matter how amazing they would seem to us maybe 20 years ago, but today they're not necessarily even thought about um, as AI. For example, language translation. Um, it may have seen, you know, 30 or 40 years ago as a science fiction to us. Today, you know, you go to Google Translate, it's all work. It's, it does take advantage or use algorithms that, um, in a broader sense, definitely part of the AI, but today we may not really think about it as AI. So artificial intelligence can be um, a relative term that is hardly absolute. Um, one could say that probably the most impressive technical advances of the later half of the last century and this century came from various applications of AI. And this field is changing. So uh, in many sense, uh, many organizations, especially since it's changing, are just beginning their AI journey and don't necessarily um, understand all the aspects in this evolving field um, well enough. Have questions like, um, what is it? What is it good for? Uh, what is the hype uh, versus 
versus reality. Um, which brings us to the next topic um, that's kind of specific to the current uh, prevalence of the use of machine learning and AI. Um, very excited, exciting techniques and technology, but there are also some serious issues about um, it being overhyped in, um, in some cases. And the issue range from the need of the training data, a very large set of training data, to um, a difficulty understanding conclusions and maybe some uncertainty about conclusions. So the black box versus, um, versus using some common sense knowledge that people are naturally um, very good at, which brings us to, uh, again, to the concept of knowledge graphs and um, how knowledge graphs combined with the machine learning approaches can actually de deliver um, excellent results and overcome some of the limitations of uh, machine learning. Let me uh, maybe explain uh, those limitations a little bit more. Uh, you probably all have remember excitement around, around um, IBM's Deep Blue and Watson um, when machine was first able to uh, win against uh, Gary Kasper, uh, Kasparov in chess, then was able to win um, goal games. Uh, against the champion, then moved on and was winning in, in jeopardy and so on. So lots, lots of excitement. And uh, that led to trying to use this kind of power in other problems beyond the game, games, more real world problems. Um, for example, finding cures for some diseases or so possible drug candidates, etc. And there it didn't work as well. And um, the conclusions the scientists came uh, with was that the statistical techniques and the learning techniques can have um, can go only so far, and you really need to combine them uh, with you know common sense, uh, common sense knowledge to facilitate uh, understanding. So uh, as a result, uh, we are in the danger of overestimating um, this type of AI technology. Again, that's, that's a quote with, that we just uh, saw earlier from Dr. Andioni, who is the CEO of Allen's Institute for Artificial Intelligence. So again, brings in the need of combining common sense knowledge with, with deep learning. Yet another one from uh, Forbes. And um, let me try to explain the points that are being made here in terms of uh, meaningful and serious indicators and background uh, knowledge versus just um, learning based on the available data and patterns. So for example, as, as people, when if we look at the picture of dogs playing outside versus picture of cats playing inside the house, we know that the background uh, is not relevant to us recognizing that we have dogs on one picture and, and cats on another. When you apply it to, uh, you know, let's say vision recognition algorithms that use uh, machine learning, um, from this type of training data is actually fairly likely that um, the conclusions the uh, machines will make is that the background of the picture is important. The strong light has something to do with this uh, dog. And the more dimmed light in the house, um, as opposed to outside, has something to do with cats. As people, we know that's not the case, and that in this case, the, the background is not relevant. Well, but sometimes the background is relevant uh, a picture of the tank in the sand, that's a weapon. A picture of the tank in the sandbox, well, that's the toy. So this is a kind of a understanding what 
is relevant in the data and what is not relevant in the data, and combining is this um, the facts and knowledge uh, that that become important. And knowledge graphs uh, are a natural um, enhancer and and combination uh, for the machine learning because that's exactly what they uh, excel at. They excel at representing knowledge, and in fact, knowledge graphs are part of AI um, technologies, and specifically the field of AI that's dedicated to expert systems, knowledge representation, uh, etc. And the strong part of knowledge graphs is that they could capture um, semantics or the meaning of data, which is what um, the machine learning approaches are uh, a week on. So that's uh, important in terms of being able to combine them together and solve the solve problems in a more reliable way. A good combination, uh, a good choice. And uh, we will be talking about um, this kind of a combination in the context of data governance, but the application of it is actually uh, much broader and, and increasingly not just Google, but many other organizations are building knowledge graphs and using them in, in a variety of ways. Um, because they can provide many enhancements to machine learning, uh, supervising uh, the application of machine learning, what's important, what's not important, what algorithms to, um, to use, providing uh, well-labeled and well-understood um, training data sets, uh, making sense of results, why, um, why certain conclusions are made and uh, whether those conclusions make sense or not. And also, um, since we need a lot of different kind of uh, training data for machine learning, often it comes from both structured and unstructured, uh, ability to integrate it in a meaningful way uh, is something that knowledge graphs can also uh, can also deliver. Uh, with that, I want to um, show you some very concrete example of uh, combining those two types of technologies in the context of information governance uh, using Tabraid Edge. So let me talk first about um, the problems that may that exist and, and may be solved. When we talk about data governance, there is lots of data. Um, diverse sources, many different data elements, and to understand the meaning of the data and to connect it, it's um, pretty common to define um, business terms, uh, describe them well enough, and then connect data elements to, to business terms. Uh, however, manual process for doing this is very labor intensive. There are really you know, tons of data sources and resilience of data elements. If we always had to do this manually, uh, the work effort would really be unsurpassable. This is why in Tabred Edge, uh, we help automate this process. Uh, remember, um, results uh, can be, uh, there can be some margin of error. So uh, human in the loop is always important, suggestions, recommendations, um, but something that people need to take into, uh, into account. How does this process work? Well, it starts, of course, with uh, cataloging data sources. And Tabred Edge can uh, catalog a variety of data sources from databases to data sets to uh, information and content management systems and, and, and so, so on. Connect to the source, bring, it, uh, bring a description into the knowledge graph. And um, the description can be pretty rich in case of databases. Uh, of course, there's tables and columns, their names, et cetera, the type of data types. 
um, those columns are, but um, also statistics, how many values, what, um, what are the min max values, what is the length of the values, um, what, frequent, what is frequency of different values, and um, all the way to actually some sampling of those values because having those samples could help us better understand what type of information we have. And it also is quite valuable in building those connections to the business terms. So uh, in case of uh, business terms, of course, we would want to give them a good description as, as people, a good and precise description as people. But to help our computers and systems such as Edge build connections, we could also provide more of a technical description, a rule that could be used for an inferencing. So what is the employee ID? Well, it's, it's unique, um, but it also has a certain format. It's, uh, it's a string, it has some number of characters, it follows some kind of a pattern. With that, uh, tab rate edge could, after cataloging a data source, take a look at the information that it's cataloged, what, what it knows about various data elements, and then it could suggest what uh, business term is likely um, to be represented by this, to be represented by, by that data. And um, Different aspects come, come into it, um, as I mentioned, sampling, statistics such as, you know, such as uh, the fact that uh, there's no nulls, the length, um, the data type, and so on. Uh, you could also bring into this, um, or tab right edge also brings into this re reasoning uh, a name of the column, although um, in some cases, that is not necessarily a strong factor as we see here, you know, yeah, here's a salesperson, um, but it is an employee ID in, in this column. So this type of uh, mapping uh, lets us then um, see the usage of the business term. We see all the various places where uh, employee ID data is stored, where data corresponding to the business term is, is stored. And in a, in a larger context, it lets us ask all sorts of, ask and answer all sorts of uh, questions. This is no longer about employee ID, it's about a different, uh, a different term, real estate loans, and the connections between this term and the data elements, and also co connections to the software program that processes this data element to report and form that contain this data element, let us um, see the lineage and answer all sorts of different questions, like what applications uh, process real estate loans? That's a question we could uh, now ask. That's a question we know now that uh, our information lets us ask and, and answer. Uh, what type of information contained on the report and uh, where it, it got gotten, it was gotten from. So um, different type of connections, data elements to terms, to uh, computer programs, to, to reports, to even the location of the servers possibly that, that run this problem, uh, then that, that run this processing because we may be interested in where our information is stored and what regulation it therefore has to comply with at each set of connections enabled by the knowledge graph. So far, uh, I mean, here in this example, we really um, explore the power of knowledge graphs and the power of uh, rules and inferencing and in reaching, we haven't really talked that much about uh, machine learning yet. And that's what my next example, um, next couple of examples go more into um, combining machine learning with, with, with knowledge graph. 
So we have defined, um, in the previous example, we have defined that business term and typically a group of experts get together and they provide that definition and it gets, gets vetted and, and, and so on. How can this process be helped? Um, often there is no way uh, to avoid the fact that the group of experts have to get together and agree. But um, there's also something that, uh, some automation that could help with those processes. Because actually um, often the business rules that are important are in fact embedded in our data. And we could turn um, this process around and say, well, uh, given our data, what can we learn from it? Can we learn some, uh, some rules and, uh, and definitions from it? And Tabrite Edge can help you with that as well. And that approach, in fact, uh, uses machine learning to um, gain some understanding from the data uh, it's a guided machine learning, and then the result is encoded in the knowledge graph for review and curation uh, by experts. So here is an example. Let's say you, you have some data about loans. You may have many different data sets about loans. And uh, maybe you want to learn something from this data. So here immediately we see uh, a concept of supervision or targeting the machine learning processing because we uh, think explicitly what we want to try to learn from this data. We want to learn something about rules for approval. <clears throat> we could also say explicitly what um, parts of the information should be paid attention to. Our data sets may have a lot of information and some may be relevant some may not be so relevant. Uh, remember that example with pictures of cats and dogs and, and the background. But similar, similarly here, we could decide that uh, the criminal record matters and income matters, but gender uh, maybe not because we know that um, this should not be taken into account. Or maybe we do want to take a look and see whether it ended up being important for the application approval or, or not. So uh, gives us ability to uh, uh, to focus our um, pattern matching and learning approaches. And out of this process comes a set of rules that can now be um, can now be stored within the knowledge graph. And uh, looking at the data, uh, the algorithm concludes that. There is high probability that uh, applicants will be rejected if they have criminal records, if they have an income um, below a certain level, and then uh, conversely, it's also true that they are likely to be approved if they don't have a record in their uh, income is, is higher than the level. And gender ended up not being important. Just a good, a good news that some things that uh, shouldn't, um, shouldn't really matter. So that was uh, an example of combining machine learning and uh, with the knowledge graph and actually um, creating knowledge graph from the output of machine learning. Another example that is actually quite interesting and important uh, today, um, given the situation we are in, I mean, I don't know how about you, but um, I think that's true for many people. With, all been looking at uh, the collection of data that we get presented uh, given the current coronavirus situation. And uh, probably are quite attuned um, with challenges that it takes to put this information together in a meaningful way. So that's a challenge um, that is often, uh, we come across often this challenge in, in health uh, data and life sciences data, although it's not unique um, to, to life sciences. Information is often characterized in a variety of ways, uh, using different terminologies, using different reference data that are local to the way data is collected and to the way questions are posed in a, in a given context. 
but then you have to bring it together and uh, in order to, re to bring it together in a, in a reliable way, you need to um, collate it correctly based on those terminologies that requires mapping the terminologies. And um, there is lots of costs associated uh, with it. Uh, for example, in UK alone, um, the annual cost of combining just certain type of data sets um, is actually nearly 700 million uh, pounds. And that is only for combining data sets that come from the uh, various institutions into the central authority. That doesn't really take the cost of uh, supporting all the local uh, data flows. So how can Tabrate Edge help? Well, uh, Tabrate Edge is an excellent tool for managing different terminologies, different reference data sets. And it has the capability for automatically inferring connections between them. And as a result, it makes it easier to combine the data, um, reuse data, and uh, provide all sorts of efficient mechanisms for actually expanding, uh, expanding the use of data. And I have a small example here. Um, we're looking at two different terminologies. One comes from American Medical Association, and it characterizes um, different claims that get submitted. And then another terminology is actually from the centers of uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Goes over some of the same topics, similar terms, different data sets, maybe using those similar terms. Think about um, clinical drug trials and how um, the data needs to be described in a variety of ways, talking about medications, adverse effects, conditions, gender, all sorts of things. Local terminologies um, get managed and uh, automa automatically mapped by EDGE, and as a result, helping to reliably aggregate and, and integrate data. So the terms that we just looked at are actually um, unstructured. Uh, data, their terms, their, their words. And um, we use unstructured data in, in many different ways, which brings me to the, to the next example. Um, I think it's a well-known fact that about 80% of enterprise data actually comes from semi-structured and unstructured various documents. So fully understanding and taking advantage of enterprise information requires closing that gap between structured and unstructured. And knowledge graphs are actually an excellent way of um, bridging this gap, since they could deal with any type of information irrespective of the format. Um, so one of the use cases for Tabred Edge is using taxonomies managed by Edge. Um, and that's an example of the type of knowledge graph, the type of um, knowledge-based and uh, structured knowledge to um, go against the body of content, which is typically in various content management systems, maybe documents in the file drive, and et cetera, and um, organize that body of uh, content and extract additional meaning uh, from them in a structured way by tagging them with the terms from those controlled vocabularies. Uses uh, machine learning approach, build semantic uh, indexes uh, after the first enrichment. Uh, it could also apply um, rules and um, run various additional in enrichments on top of those uh, machine learning processes to extract even a richer uh, body of meaning. And then uh, the end result can be provided to business users and also importantly to various uh, services and, and APIs. So a little bit more on this uh, example and you know, some of a collage of um, various screenshots from Tabred Edge, including one that um, 
shows how the knowledge, uh, how the learning processes get uh, targeted from um, using the training data set, from um, setting the evaluation criteria, and then uh, learning from that and applying it to the um, broader um, basis of, of knowledge. One of the um, one of the issues with knowledge graphs that uh, actually standards and using uh, web infrastructure help us uh, address it, with addressing is the fact that well um, there's lots of knowledge so um, actually curating all of this in the knowledge graph is is a large undertaking. Luckily, um, we now can leverage information uh, presented and curated by different organizations. A large body of uh, knowledge graph information is available in the Google, uh, Google Graph, knowledge graph, of course. It's also available in Wikidata. It's also available in other domain-specific knowledge graphs, uh, such as Blue Brain Nexus, for example, uh, which is about uh, scientific knowledge and, and data. And because it's based on the, on the standards, we could actually reach out to remote knowledge graphs and enrich our internal enterprise knowledge graphs with the information you know, curated and provided uh, by other people. So that's kind of a crowdsourcing of this knowledge basis that is made available by uh, through standards. And that's also supported by um, Subred Edge. So one thing that I want to um, mention as we um, coming to towards the end of this webinar is uh, the topic of the governance of the use of AI and machine learning itself. Um, with the algorithmic and statistical approaches um, to AI, there is also uh, there is always kind of this common theme of how are we going to govern that? Um, machine learning requires a lot of data. Lots of data requires governance. Machine learning requires uh, reliable and well-labeled data. So again, that translates translate to governance. Um, machine learning requires understanding how conclusions were derived and what algorithms May, may be used and what algorithms should be used depending on the problem because there's many different techniques that could be used. So all of this comes under umbrella of the governance, which is important in order for people to trust uh, the results and outcome of, of machine learning, which can uh, be impacted by so-called adverse um, reaction when um, small changes in, in the learning data, uh, changes that may be even not just irrelevant but unperceptible to, to people, result in completely different conclusions, often um, some, sometimes, sometimes erroneous. So in terms of governance and uh, in, the world, in the world of uh, AI, there's various uh, places um, where governance is important, management of training data sets, creating reliable training data, configurable, configuring what data to pay, pay attention to, what specific aspects of data to pay attention to, capturing what AI algorithms to use, and, 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 and so on. So with that, um, I think that I hope that I built um, a good case and um, explain why knowledge graphs are so important for uh, data governance in today's world that requires a lot of flexibility, uh, has to deal with uh, a lot of diverse data, and has to become increasingly more and more intelligent and more and more open in a way that we uh, deal and use, deal with this data and use this data. 
And of course, Subred Edge is an example of the knowledge graph based infrastructure that tries to address these challenges and opportunities. So uh, with that, I wonder, Christy, if we have um, any questions that we have time to questions. We do have a couple, Irene. I know it's getting close to the hour, but we may be able to address these real quick. Um, if you do have a question that you haven't submitted, please go ahead and submit those questions in the question box located on the right-hand side control panel. If we don't get it today, we'll um, get back to you via email. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we do have. Here's question number one. Um, are AI and machine learning the same thing? Um, so I, I've tried to, um, I think in, in the presentation, I've tried to um, address that to, um, to some extent, but um, so maybe the question um, came from early in the presentation. Uh, right. uh, it's not um, it's not necessarily the same thing, uh, but it's definitely uh, highly related. So machine learning is uh, one type of technology that is used uh, as a part of AI um, arsenal of tools. Remember, I mentioned that there is a wide variety of tools uh, ranging from various search algorithms to uh, you know natural language processing techniques to rules and knowledge bases to neural networks you know neural networks are quite popular you know um, deep learning deep not in the sense that semantics is well understood but in the sense that there are multiple layers of uh, neural networks that are used in the in the learning um, in the learning processes so it's uh, one aspect of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence apply uh, can be used as a solution to a variety of problems. And depending on the problem at hand, different approaches may be uh, more appropriate um, than others, may result in, in better results than others. And quite often combining those different techniques because they complement each other. Uh, is the most powerful approach. Great. Um, thank you, Irene. Let's see if we can squeeze one more question in. Um, here's a question. Can you plug in different machine learning algorithms into Top Braid Edge? There are many available these days for different applications. Yeah, that's uh, a great question, Christy. And um, the answer is uh, yes. Um, and there's um, a number of places where different algorithms can be plugged in. Of course, Tabray that ships already with some pre-built models, some pre-built rules, they um, can be added by users and they are added to by users on a regular basis. It's also is shipped with some pre-built integration with certain you know, algorithms um, that has to do with machine learning. But there is also a way to plug in um, other algorithms and other approaches. For example, I showed an example where two vocabularies were automatically crosswalked by Tabrade Edge. Uh, and we're using some built-in approaches for that. Uh, but there is an extension point where another algorithm can be, uh, can be plugged in. And um, also the approaches are flexible in the sense that you could say what's more important to you, what's less important to you, etc. Uh, further, I mentioned several times that the standards and the open nature of the knowledge graph technologies are very important. And the knowledge graph contain um, uh, the facts, but also models uh, and reach models with rules, etc. All of this information is um, openly available through for query in a very flexible way, um, all levels of knowledge graphs. So for example, if you already have in place some system uh, that uses um, some AI algorithms that um, 
that you believe is important and you using it and you want to take advantage of the knowledge graph in Tab Red Edge, then um, in addition to plugging something into Tab Red Edge for its execution, you could also do the reverse and reach out to the knowledge graph in Tab Red Edge and bring that information in as needed to whatever um, whatever processes and algorithms uh, you are currently using. Great. Thank you, Irene. We are right a little bit past the hour, so I'm thinking we probably should wrap today up. If we didn't get to your question, we will provide answers to those questions in the form of an email response to all attendees, so be on the look, at, look out for that. We'll also provide a link to the recorded presentation as well as to the slides. So thank you, Irene and Robert, for your time today. We certainly think that everyone um, found today's information valuable. Thank you for your attention and have a great day. Bye-bye.